All right, so today we are talking about the seed of David. So our first, this is of the three promised seeds that we're talking about. The first one was the seed of a woman in Genesis. The second, which is salvation, redemption, the destruction of Satan. The second seed is seed of Abraham, which is the promised spirit, the blessing of God. And now we're talking about the seed of David. And this is so deep and rich. All of them are. But there's so much to the seed of David. This is going to be part one. And today it's going to be the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God. The seed of David declared to be the son of God. Next week, we're going to talk about the seed of David in the aspect of the building of the house of God and the kingdom. So we're going to start in Romans 1, verses 3 through 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So this here is, is talking about Jesus Christ is the seed of David who was born according to the flesh. This is talking about the incarnation of Jesus. And he was born of the lineage of David, of Mary, and declared to be the Son of God. So Jesus is begotten twice. We are begotten once. So when it says born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God. So when he was born according to the flesh as a baby of Mary, the virgin, he was God putting on hum humanity. It is the spirit of God coming down into Mary and she conceived of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, and Jesus was born and he was the word became flesh. It said the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And so and then in um, John 3, 16, that is born according to the flesh. Incarnation, he became the son of man. And Daniel specifically prophesied about him being the son of man. And he had to be born a man in likeness of sinful flesh that he may atone for our sins that we may be set free from the tyranny and enslavement and bondage of sin and Satan to be taken out of the corrupt system of the world and that we may be right with God and by his Holy Spirit in us we are becoming like Christ in our soul. So when his spirit, when through believing, when, he, when we believe in Jesus, his spirit, his Holy Spirit becomes one with our spirit and we are regenerated, children of God, and we are becoming sons of God in our soul. So right now, what we're talking about with Jesus, according to Romans 1, is he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So, and declared to be the son of God. Those are the, the both begotten's. So when he is born according to the flesh, the only begotten of the Father from eternity, God coming to earth by putting on humanity in the form of a man as his son. That is what happened in that when he was born of a woman, when he was born of Mary. So John 1.14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his 
only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so he was begotten from eternity born of a woman as a man that is begotten this is the begotten the only begotten son of the father So now the next part is declared to be the son of God through the resurrection of the dead. Because on verse four, Romans one, four, it says, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of from the dead and that same spirit of holiness is in our spirit if we believe in Jesus and we are to live by that spirit so that we can walk according to God we can walk according to his commands and we can fulfill his plans and purposes so the son of God is begotten twice through incarnation and resurrection so in Acts 13:33 it says, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. In 1 Peter 1, 3, it said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so he is begotten through resurrection he is begotten through incarnation as the son of man and he is declared to be the son of God he is not the son of God according to the spirit yet but he is the son of man begotten of the father from eternity this is deep so um through resurrection, he is begotten as the Son of God by the Spirit, the first among many brethren. That's our begotten. He is the firstborn of all creation. That means that he is begotten through resurrection, that when we believe in him, we die with him, that we raise with him, and we are begotten of the Spirit. That's the second begotten. And we are declared, we are, not declared, we are children of God, sons and daughters of God. Um, Romans 8, 28 20 through 29 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. John 1, 12 through 13. But as many as believe, received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's our begotten. And that's his second begotten. Born of the spirit, we become children of God. Why? Because he is spirit. The Father is not a man. The Father is a spirit. Jesus, the Son, is a man, is a person, because he was born as the Son of Man from the bosom of the Father. And he was begotten of the Spirit through resurrection, and that's when he was called the son of God yes he was always the son of God but he was declared the son of God as he rose from the dead resurrected in the spirit to everlasting life which he did that to pave away the pioneer and the captain of our salvation that we may follow because he is the firstborn among many brethren and we are the many brethren and we are the many sons of God I just want to point out one more thing. I think it's in Isaiah. Um, 
it's the one it's it's the verse where maybe it's 55 no nope, we talk about 55 later okay what I'm looking for is the verse where it says where it talks about Jesus and it says that it's the verse where it says today we have been given uh, it's 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 today to us a child is born and a son is given and he will be the um, called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father the the son today a child has been born who is the mighty God today a son has been given who is the everlasting father so we have to understand that Jesus he is our, the creator and then he's also the created he is he says if you have seen me you have seen the father he says it is it is my father who does the works so the father is in the son the son came to declare the father so the father and the son are one and through his spirit we are one with them and we have to understand there, there's people who say well I have a you know I can accept the son but I have a hard time accepting the father because there's traumatic father uh, um, trauma father trauma in their past but you have to understand that if you accept the son you've already accepted the father because he says that if you he says if if you if you if you receive the father you receive the son if you if you deny the son you deny the father the two are one the baby that was born is a mighty God the son that was given is the everlasting father so the seed of David came through the lineage born according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God so if we look at all the seeds it is painting a picture of the gospel of salvation in all its parts in all its aspects and it's astounding how the Old Testament really brings in the fullness and all of its parts that are realized in the New Testament so the next part is the root and the offspring of David so in Revelation 22 16 it says I Jesus he's talking to um, John one of the disciples when he was caught up by the Spirit when he was on the island of Patmos he was caught up in the Spirit and he's having a vision it's the book of Revelation and Jesus says I Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches I am the root and offspring of David the bright and morning star see David sprang from Christ as his creator and Christ was born of the seed of David in his humanity so Christ is both creator as God and created as the Son of Man so in Matthew 1 1 it says the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham and now Jesus keep in mind he is a mighty God he is the everlasting father and he is also a son he is also a son of God and he's a son of David it's incredible and all this was done that we may receive the fullness of grace and truth that is in Jesus Christ not only that we may be set free to receive the life of God into our spirit that we can live according to God but that we can live and reign in this life by the one who is Jesus Christ and that's in Romans see when he died on the cross 
sin was dealt with, Satan was dealt with, the world was judged, and the self was crucified. Everything that could come against us has been dealt with, annulled, and it has been conquered by the cross. And we, and when we believe in Jesus, that he, that he was crucified on the cross, that he was buried, and three days later he rose again to eternal life, and in believing, and through repentance, because repentance and believing, they go hand in hand you can't separate the two when you come to believe in Christ you have the repentance that comes up because repentance is 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 the core of the cross it is is us believing in the sacrifice Jesus made that we can be atoned for our sins but we need to repent of our sins and turn from them in order to turn to God if we believe without repentance we're deceived and the blood of Jesus Christ does not cover our sins and if the blood of Jesus Christ does not cover our sins we perish we perish a second death that is eternal separation from God this is what he died to give us and we need to understand that we need to repent and live a life of repentance according to his Holy Spirit the Spirit it's the power of the spirit of holiness that we are children of God and by which we are able to live by, to be in power, that we live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh, that we can live in life and righteousness and not in sin and death. We have to understand that we have to turn our allegiance, our servitude, our worship and our adoration from ourselves, the flesh, the world, sin into Jesus Christ through the spirit it is we have to we have to have that revelation and this is what came out of the seed of David the the born according to the flesh and declared the son of God that he may pave a way for us through faith that we may who were born according to the flesh may become children of God through the spirit this is what it's all about and why why so the plans and purposes of god the father can go forth and we will learn about that at the next aspect of the seed of david which is the building of the house of god and the kingdom of god because we have to understand we are born into a natural realm and the natural realm which is according to this world and according to us in our flesh it, it causes us to be so consumed about ourselves and so consumed about about fitting in the world and just and just is sucking everything we can out of it for ourselves and that is not what this life is about this life is about self-denial this life is about being in the world but not of it it's about walking according to life in the spirit and not according to selfishness in the world and we are here for the plans of God and the purpose of God is people it's souls it's that they may be set free and come to know him it's not just about being set free Free so we can live a good life it's about knowing God who created us he created us and he created us intentionally with a purpose that he gives us gifts and talents that we may walk according to this life fully equipped for every good work that is his plans and purposes it's not about us and that is the full gospel but we're going to get to that next week because many of us don't have a, a picture of the latter and we only have a picture of us and what's done for us and us and what we can get and how we can live and what we want to fulfill and I have been called by God you know we've all been called by God if you have been called to Jesus you have been you have received the calling to be called to God to come out of the old out of ourselves, out of the world and go into God and into the kingdom that we are functioning according to the spirit and not according to the flesh because if we live according to the flesh if we live according to our own selfishness and the desires for the world for self-seeking and gain to build our name everybody wants to leave behind a legacy we uh, we the legacy is Jesus why so future generations are not lost in darkness stumbling not even knowing where they're going it's so they can have the light of life within them so they can see so that when we come to the end of our 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 our, our, our lives either on earth or in heaven we are not be just overtaken by guilt and 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 
regret because we are so empty after a, a lifetime of gorging ourselves on our own lusts of our flesh and our mind we are empty and we realize that our life is nothing because it is nothing because life of the soul is not life life of the spirit is true life and that's life everlasting that means that you were not after death we will be with God and not separated from him because we chose to be separated from him here he is calling out to every person and he's calling them to themselves and that calling has nothing to do with us but has everything to do with him So he was sown. Okay, we're at the root and the offspring of David. So by him, all things created, and he is the firstborn of all creation. In Colossians 1, 15 through 18, says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. This is talking about Jesus, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He is the creator and he became part of, his, of the creation in order to redeem his creation from a curse and from death and from separation from him. That is what happened as the seed of David. So he is sown as the seed of David in his humanity through death that we may be the many grains through resurrection. And what I'm talking about, you can find in, in John 12, 23 through 24, it says, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now he's talking about his crucifixion and resurrection. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So Christ is talking about himself, that he must die in order to produce many grains, and that's us. So Christ is in our spirit as life. The life of God making us children of God, he is our example in death and life. And he said this as an example to how we need to go forward with him. Because in 1 Peter 3.18, he said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And that is exactly what happens to us. It says that if that we die with him to live with him, meaning we die to our flesh to live by the Spirit. We die to the old man, which is Adam, to live by the new man, which is Christ. And we do that through his spirit in our spirit. And as a grain dies, as a seed falls to the ground and dies, it, only then will it produce. Otherwise, it lives and dies alone. Unless it falls to the ground and dies, it germinates, it, it produces many grains, it lives and dies to itself and that's why we need to die to ourselves because if we live to ourselves we will live and die alone but if we die to ourselves we will be alive in the spirit and from that there will be many grains because we will be walking according to the plans and purposes of God in his heart is the souls of men that none should perish in Romans 8:10 it says, "And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But even if, even though we, we, we die to ourselves, we still have a sinful nature in our flesh. That is why we need to be continued in the word, in prayer, in the body that nourishes and supplies everything we need that 
we are able to live according to the spirit because of righteousness and righteousness is is the ways of God it's it's what he does and we have become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ that according to the spirit of Christ we may do and be according to the ways of God that's righteousness and even we have this this sin in our flesh we will always have temptations we will always have these desires that and sin all sin is is seductress it seduces that we that we are unfaithful to God because if we give ourselves to sin we have committed adultery that's the that's the heartthrob of the Old Testament about God saying do not turn away from me and when they would turn away to to go after other gods they were committing adultery so sin is seductive lust is seductive our own van imaginations are are seductive trying to seduce us away from God so just as Jesus said that uh, as uh, as and he was talking about before he was going to his crucifixion he said as a grain falls to the ground it must die that he may produce many grains he's talking about his death and his resurrection and in the new and in Rome and in um and in, in John just after that he turns because he said that in John 12, 24 through 26. And then right after he, or 23 through 24. And then right after that, he turns to his disciples, 24 through 26, and says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. 25 he who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me let him follow me and where I am there my servant will be also if anyone serves me him my father will honor so he talks about him being sown as a grain of wheat to the ground and dies that it may produce much grain and then he turns and tells us that we must be sown as a seed and die in order to produce much grain how he says he who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me let him follow me and where I am there my servant may be also follow him we follow him to the cross in the believing we must die to ourselves that we may live to him we must die as a seed to the ground that many seeds may be um, produced that we may produce many seeds and we also see this in the New Testament he says in John 15 he says abide in me and I in you why for that without that we would die but that we may produce fruit. He says, if you are me, I am you, you will produce fruit. We are to produce fruit. And what is the fruit of the vine? It's the grape. And what is the fruit of the grape? It's the wine. And he told his disciples, he said, I will not at the last supper drink of this wine again until you are with me at the, and he said in heaven at the marriage feast of the lamb that is wine that is that we produce wine through our lives engrafted into the olive tree uh, grafted into the vine as the many branches that that our life is that he is the source and the sustenance of our life and that, that we produce the fruit which is the grape of the vine that we may produce the wine that we will partake that he will partake with us at the marriage supper feast of the lamb. I think I'm saying that right. So we die with him to live with him. Romans 6, 6 through 11. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's as the grain and as the many grains. Knowing that Christ 
having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, that's us, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is telling us this is the example we follow. There is no other route. There is no way around it. This is the way and it's a narrow path. And many who go on the wide path, it leads to destruction, but very few find the narrow path. And this is the narrow path. And in this, we will truly find our life. Because what he is talking about in John 12, verse 25, he said, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He who loves his life, that's suke, that's the soul life, will lose it, living according to us and our desires and our preferences and what we want to do, even if we're building something for God, but we're building it for us. It says, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And that he who hates his suke life in this world will will keep it for eternal life. And what we will keep is the divine life. It's the divine life within us. That is the eternal life. We must see Jesus, when he went to the cross, he was up there. He was perfect in his soul. That means his soul life was crucified. And as he was raised and resurrected, that was, he was his divine life, begotten of the spirit and declared he was the son of God, begotten. He said, and the father says, today I have begotten you. And it's the day of resurrection according to Psalm. I think it is 2-7. And I think it's Two or two seventeen or it, it's in it's in Acts three um thirteen thirty three or three thirty three. That's what he's talking about. And likewise we need to crucify our soul life that we may receive his divine life because we cannot live by both we either live by one or live by the other that's why paul says i die daily he says i die daily every day he has to he has to count everything that he's ever been everything that he's ever done as garbage as Dung. That means poop. He consider, considers it as dung. Why? That he may attain Christ. That he may um, reach for the high calling of God, which is Christ. Because in Christ is all the wisdom, in all the knowledge. In Christ is treasures. In him is all the treasures. And it says that Christ is the mystery of God. And the church is the mystery of Christ. That's us. And it is by his life we live by. That's why we have to die to our own personal soul life because we cannot live by his life in our natural soul life at the same time. It's impossible. Yes, his life is in our spirit, but that just got us in the door because he said, I am the door. I am the only way to the Father is through me. That got us through the door. That's just the stepping stone. The rest we are to continue on in sanctification. By the power of the spirit of holiness, which is in our spirit, by which we live by, for the full stature of the perfect man in Christ to be formed in us. Because that is the purpose. That is the plan. So we're going to end this and I'm going to close with this one thing. And uh, I was going to do a message just solely on this, but it fits so perfectly in this. It goes hand in hand with the seed of David. And that's called the sure mercies of David. Now, I never even noticed the sure mercies of David. I mean, I read over it. I can't even count how many times. But not until I did this in-depth study of the seed of David did I grasp the sure mercies of David, or even noticed it as something that is, is so profound and deep in its aside. And it's, it's, it's very high. It is very high. So Isaiah 55, one through four, it says, 
Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and you sh your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. So this is a lot and we're going to break it down because it's so important because in here is the gospel. So the sure mercies of David is the everlasting covenant. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the covenant as our life and all that he is and provides for us. So it talks about, he says, every, and do you notice Jesus? He says, I am, and he says, believe in me and, and out of, out of you, out of your belly will come rivers of living water. We drink from the rivers of God by that we drink from the cup of salvation by calling upon the name of the Lord. And then he also says, he says, he says, I am the bread from heaven. He is our food. He is our water. Jesus throughout the New Testament has presented himself as our air, as our water, as our food, as our shelter, as our clothing. And that's a whole other lesson. And here in Isaiah 55, he says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. That is the waters of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is the fountain. And out of the fountain comes the flow, the waters bubbling up into everlasting life. That is the flow of the Spirit that comes from our spirit. And it saturates our soul. And he says, and then, so he says, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Eat what is good, he says. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. And here in this, it encompasses everything that we've talked about is from the seed of David, who are born according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God. And, and that through him, he died according to the flesh, that he may live according to the spirit, the first of many brethren. The first of many brethren resurrected from the dead. That it never, it, that he was the first that we could be the many brethren, but we must die to our flesh in order to live to the spirit. And that's what he was talking about. Cause if we are not living to the spirit, we're living to our soul. But in Isaiah 55, he is prophesying and he says, and let your soul delight itself in abundance because we have to understand that it's through sanctification as our soul is renewed according to our mind according to the word the spirit of our mind Christ is formed in us he is the living waters he is the bread he is the abundance and we are so wanting to cling to our own identity to the soul that has been formed that conformed to sin and lust in this weird identity that has been that has been conformed by the world that is just foolishness really when we come to know Christ as life and we looked at who we tried to be according to who we thought we were in the world we look silly it's ridiculous and I know that it was for me and so he says delight your soul in abundance see we will never find abundance in the world we will never find abundance in sin because what those things are is rooted in death and their their end is everlasting fire and if we 
live according to them and not according to the Lord. We will be judged with the sin that we cling to, that we consistently choose to serve. And we will be judged with the world which we cling to, that we have have identified as our home and our identity. And we must go with it instead of confronting it and living in it according to life and not according to everything that it 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 seduces and allures it's deception it's not real it's not real it is deceptive it's darkness and it's death but the true abundance that our soul delights in is is according to the spirit it's the word it's prayer it's it's going inward and calling upon the name of the lord and drinking of the cup of salvation which is everyone who thirsts come to the waters that is the waters you who have no money come by and eat how is that possible you who have no money come by and eat that doesn't make sense yes come buy wine and milk without money and without price that does not make sense but it does make sense that the money he is talking about is the natural the money is the mammon the money in the price is is the things that are associated to that but he says come and buy how do we buy something when he says you who have no money come and buy without money and without price how do we buy well the cost is ourselves the cost is ourselves and that fits exactly what he is talking about we must die in order to live the cost is us it's the old man it's our sin it's our flesh it's everything we think we need to be and we look to Christ and we cling to him as our life the cost is us that is the cost Money and the price of money cannot buy the abundance that our soul is made to delight in. It only comes from the waters of the living God. It only comes from the life of God himself coming down to earth in the form of a man to redeem his creation that we may be one with him in spirit, that we may become the children of God, the sons of God in our soul and walk with authority and dominion and power that is according to the power of the spirit of holiness according to the authority of the person of Jesus Christ and that is the purpose and he says here and your soul shall live because even though if we don't know God even our soul is dead we are a living being according to the flesh we're breathing but our soul is dead our soul is dead no matter how it, the only it's it's energized by the 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 um world it's energized by sin even if we live a good life and have done everything right we have a great family we have a house we have never done drugs we've done all those things we are still dead in our goodness because the only life is the life of Jesus given to us through the death and the resurrection from the cross and that is in our spirit and it saturates our soul as we drink of the living waters that is the purpose acts 13 32 through 35 and we declare to you glad tidings now this is in reference he says in, in isaiah 55 he says i will make an a, a 55 40 he says i will make a no three i will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. The everlasting covenant is the new covenant. The new covenant is Jesus himself. In Acts 13, 32 through 35, it says, And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That is the day of resurrection. And that he raised him from the dead. No more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he says in another psalm. You will not allow your holy one 
to see corruption. And that promise is made to us. Even though we die, we shall live. We will not see corruption either. Or, you know, we will get glorified bodies also. But Jesus, when he died on the cross and he was buried, his body, body didn't decay. It never saw corruption. And when he was raised from the dead in resurrection, well, first he went down into the bowels of hell and preached to the spirits. The, 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 the angels chained up the demonic um, rulers and authorities that were underneath their Satan. He preached to them. He said he, he preached to them and he led them in a public shame that they are defeated. And then he raised up and in a glorified body. The tomb was rolled away and he came out as a glorified body. Mary and the disciples, they didn't even recognize him. But see, this is a picture of what is for us. This is the, he is the captain this in the the pioneer the captain of our salvation and we will follow him in these steps we're not going to go down and preach to anybody but when we die we will be resurrected with a new body and we will not see corruption we will not see the second death so through his death he fulfilled the old covenant through his resurrection he became the new covenant so the Old Covenant, which is the Old Testament, is a picture. It is a picture of God. And the New Covenant is a person, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. And the person is the picture. He fulfills the picture, but it's not just a picture. The person is the fulfillment of the picture because the person is the substance of the picture. The old covenant was a picture of God. The new covenant is the person of God. And he is the new covenant. In Hebrews 9, 18 through 20, it says, Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses, he's talking about the old covenant, had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Because there has to be, everybody was in sin and death because of the curse that came through the first fall of sin. The only thing that could overcome the sin and death is life. That's the only thing that can cover death is life. And it's not life in our soul. It's the life of God. That's why God had to come down in the form of a man that his blood can atone for sin and death because only his life can conquer death no other life not the life of animals calves and goats see in the new old testament it said the life is in the blood that life is not suke it's not zoe which is soul life or divine life that life in what he talks about in the old testament i don't know the i did a study on it and i, don't, I can't remember the exact verse but it says that the life is in the blood i think it's in one of the old deuteronomy one of those books and what that is talking about is the life according to the blood. The life of an animal is in the blood of an animal. The life of a person is in the blood of a person. The life of a goat is in the blood of a goat. The life of a lamb is in the blood of the lamb. That's what it meant by this. Because then you can come to Hebrews 9 and it said that... This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. But and and then in Hebrews then but see if you in Hebrews 9 28 it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. That's his second appearing, and we do not want to be asleep. We want to be living according to his spirit, which is the power of holiness. Because in Hebrews 10, so remember what I told you about the life is in the blood. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, it says, Therefore, when he came into the world, this is Jesus, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body 
you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure then I said behold I have come and the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will O God see it was the blood of Christ and that alone which could atone for our sins and overcome death not the blood of animals which in the Old Testament they did sacrifices of animals to atone for the people every year but Jesus came the first time as a priest when he was born of a baby as a mighty God as a son who is the everlasting father and he was um, raised up and at 30 he embarked on his ministry which 30 was the age the priests started in their ministry in the temple and for three years he walked on this earth and then he was crucified and rose again and he rose as the high priest that, that, that would have to die no more that in believing in him we would have atonement that means that our death has been overcome by his life that we don't have to see death when we die that our sins have been covered and atoned for that we do not have to pay a price that we cannot pay for sin that he did it all by his blood the life is in the blood and the life of God was in the blood of God who came and sacrificed himself for humans we cannot atone for ourselves because we are sinful from birth and, and we are conceived in sin because the curse is handed down from Adam the first man who lived on this earth sin cannot atone for sin that's why he had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh to judge sin to crucify sin in the flesh Galatians 3 23 through 26 says this, but before faith came we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, in the faith is Jesus. Jesus himself is faith to us. And by believing in him, he becomes our faith that we live by because we're living according by his life, according to his spirit. And verse, um, so Galatians 3, 24, it says, Therefore, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. So the law in the Old Testament was a tutor to expose sin, that it may become exceedingly sinful, so that man would know his state before God, that we are under a curse, that we are sin separated from him by sin, under the curse, under death. And we need a savior. That was a picture, the law and the commandments. It, it's a standard of holiness. And it's all about people. We should love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And then we shall have no other gods before us, only God. And then it says, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not steal, do not murder. Those are all things that we are not to do because we are all one. We are one spirit with the Lord when he is in our spirit. And we are all one spirit with each other. It teaches us how to love God and how to love others. None of them about us because it's not about us. We are about God and then about people. And, and, and he is our true life because it says Jesus is your real life in the New Testament. So the law was to show us the standard of God. It, it was a picture of God's character. And the character that man needs to have before him. But there was no way to keep the law. That's why the tutor was to bring us to Christ. So when Christ came, we would be justified by faith because he fulfilled the law. That means he paid the price of death, which the law required. And he, then through doing that in his spirit in us, the life of God in us, we are able to keep the law by living according to his spirit because we automatically walk according to to what the law demands because it's what God is it's his character so John 1 16 through 17 it says and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ 
Grace is the very presence of God within us to live by. Truth is the truth. And in truth is light and truth is life. You cannot separate them. And he says the word, he says, wash them by the water of your word. He says, your word is truth. Jesus is saying that to the father. His word is life and light. According to John 1, it says that he did in him was life and that light was, that life was the light of man. He was the word become flesh. And so we cannot separate that. In him was grace and truth. In him was life and light. And all that is in our spirit. And it shines forth into our soul. And that is what by living according to Christ happens. And it says in Isaiah 42, 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles. So this is Isaiah prophesying of the father speaking to Jesus. He says, and I, he says, I have called you in righteousness because he is a righteousness. He has a scepter of righteousness. He rules, he walks. He is the works of God. He is, he declares God. He is the perfect. He is the picture of God. The, he is God in the flesh. He is what he says. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. He says, I will keep you. The father is saying this to Jesus through his prophecy. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the Gentiles. We are a Gentile if we are not Jewish. So he is the covenant. He is the New Testament. The covenant became the New Testament when Jesus died because Paul says you cannot have a testament unless you have the death of the testator. That's Jesus. The new covenant is a relationship and the relationship is a marriage. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it says God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are called into fellowship with Jesus. We are called into a relationship. And he made that possible through our spirit because our spirit is the organ through which we contact God. That is the only way we can have contact with God is through our spirit that is one with the spirit of God. That is the purpose of our spirit is to commune with God. And it's only possible through the life of Christ in our spirit that we may have fellowship with him. So God, we love you. Father, I pray that we come to know you, Lord. Lord, that we seek you, that we seek you above all else, God. Father, that our eyes are open to the word, which is the truth, which is the water that washes us clean and pure. We thank you, God. We thank you for Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You have done everything for us. And now it's up to us what we do with what you have done. And according to what we do with the incredible gift of the life of God, which was sacrificed for us that we may live by that life, we will be judged. And I pray that we live according to that day now, that everything we do and say, that we do it in the light of Jesus Christ, that we do it in the light of your word, that we do it in the light of eternity. God, we love you. We thank you. And we call upon you. For anyone who doesn't know him, we just we need to call upon Jesus. We, we need to acknowledge him, receive what he did. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross, that you rose again, and that you died for my sin. We repent of our sins. Name them. Call them out. Forgive people you need to forgive. Ask for forgiveness from God. Seek forgiveness from people when it's safe. Sever the soul ties that we've made through sin, renounce all ungodliness, read the word, be in prayer. Every day we need to drink from the cup of salvation by calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus, help me. He is there with us. And I pray that everyone takes this seriously because this is the, the, the peak of every high thing. It is higher than Mount Everest. It is higher than anything you can attain to achieve in this life. Because without the life of God, we will die and spend eternity in darkness because 
eternity is either it's 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 not a matter of hell and heaven when you come to the core of it it's a matter of with god or without god we want to be with him his blood covers our sins that we can have communion with him that we can be right with him that we can be justified by the faith of jesus christ he is our faith he is everything